Hey guys, Bruno Build Show. Special kind of video today. I'm showing you a talk that I gave to Collin Technical College up in North Dallas to a group of carpentry and interior design students talking about my book, Historic Moldings, kind of period moldings and period details. But I start talking about proper details and moldings and, and what moldings are supposed to do, the lost art of building. So check it out. I think you guys will find it interesting. It's a little bit long, but there's great content in there. So let me know what you think. I am from Dallas, uh, went to Baylor, met my wife there, um, went to a uh, school in Boston called the North Bennett Street School, uh, oldest trade school in the country. Uh, they have, they're kind of a old world trade school. Uh, they have violin making, they have traditional furniture making, they have book binding. Harvard and Yale went to North Bennett Street and said, start a book binding program because we're having to send all our books back to Europe. So uh, it's a neat place. They have a program called Preservation Carpentry, which is what I studied, which was museum quality historic preservation, um, and learned how things were made 250 years ago. Um, it grounded me in this kind of perspective on building that I came back to Texas and started my company in Fort Worth um, doing historic preservation and also remodeling houses and redoing things. And so um, I have this perspective on the way things used to be built and the way things are built today. And I'm like, ah, um, I don't think we build beautifully anymore. And I don't think we do things. I think we lost the art of building. Um, you can go on my YouTube. Anybody on YouTube? Ever watch my YouTube videos? So uh, I say that a lot, right? You, you, you've, you've heard that if you've watched any of my YouTube. So I'm also writing a book right now called uh, Historic Millwork from 1740 to 1950. Um, and so we're, I'm gonna take you through the molding chapter uh, right to the, today, and it'll be very relevant um, to the moldings that I suspect if you guys are getting out there, I'll just tell you that no one knows how to do moldings today. Okay, no one, except me, <laughs> no. Um, very few people, 1% of people know how to put moldings together. Builders don't, architects aren't trained in it. Um, I don't know what your training is, whether your teacher's teaching you these things or not, but I'm gonna show you some of the, the ideas behind moldings and millwork um, that uh, we're no longer practicing. So I tell you that because you have a great opportunity and craftsmen as well to teach and train and help people build better. Um, so hopefully you'll get that out of today's talk. Today we're gonna to talk about understanding moldings, how they're designed, how they're put together, what their purpose is. We're gonna talk a little bit about identifying moldings and it'll help you understand picking and choosing moldings, learning more about it. Okay, I show this picture because this was a 1970s house that we worked on. I have two companies. I have a building company, remodeling company called Hull Homes and I have a millwork company. Uh, that does architectural millwork. So we do both things. Um, I show this picture because I think there is power in moldings, okay? This was an entry hall to a house, 1970s house, not very architecturally interesting, but all we did was change the moldings in this room and it dramatically changed how that opening feels, right? We didn't change the height of it. We just changed the moldings, okay? We changed the width of the moldings. We understood that the chair rail height was very important. Um, we understood that there, there's this idea called punctuation that defines an opening. And so power in moldings, if you didn't know that was possible, that it is possible. And that's the way things used to be designed and put together. The problem is today is that in 1760, a builder or someone said to a craftsman, build a mantle and they built the mantle on the left. And today we say build a mantle and they build the mantle on the right. And I would argue that the mantle on the left has proportion and scale and craftsmanship and organization of how the moldings are put together that the other one with store-bought brackets and kind of pieced together MDF design pieces put together doesn't. Um, We've forgotten how to build. Uh, we've forgotten how to put things together, how to design things. 
Moldings have a language. Moldings have, they are, they are, uh, they communicate, okay? These are three door casings. A Georgian door casing at the top, a federal door casing, neoclassical door casing. So Georgian 1740, 1780, somewhere in that range. Neoclassical 1790 to 1820 here in America. And then a French molding, all very different, okay? All are gonna reflect their light differently. All are unique and different. In fact, I think moldings from the different periods are so distinctive that if I took my hand stuck it in the past and pulled out a molding, I could tell you what period and when it comes from because they're so distinctive. So do not think that moldings are all the same. In fact, I just did a video on YouTube called Never y Use a Molding Designed After 1950. Um, that's because it's all crap after 1950. So this means that you can't go to Home Depot and find good moldings. You can't go to most lumber yards and find good moldings, okay? So it's, it's very difficult to get moldings that make sense that are the right size, and I'm gonna show you that, but uh, there is a language, there is, a, there is communication that takes place with moldings. Here's another example, okay? So this crown molding on the left is a new McMansion-y time, uh, molding and the molding on the right is from a 1740s house uh, up in winter tour if you haven't been a winter tour you need to go if you look at the molding on the left look at the bottom left corner and if i didn't have that corner to show you what those different profiles were and you were forced to just look up the wall and read those moldings it's very difficult to know what those moldings are doing okay it's very difficult to understand how the light is reflecting, whether it's, it's concaved, whether it's convex, and so it just reads as a bunch of lines up on the ceiling, versus the cornice that's from the 1740s, where you see a clear crown molding at the top, a gap, a pause, and then a bed mold underneath. And we've forgotten how to put that pause in there. It's like if, you, if you're speaking in a run-on sentence, and I, everything I do, and I don't need to stop it, I need to give it to right? That's a run on sentence. There's no pause, okay? Moldings need a pause, and good moldings and good design have that blank space, that, that pause there that helps you read moldings. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a language, and we're gonna show you more examples of that. Moldings also have purpose, okay? They have a job that they do. And historically, designers, when they were looking at moldings and designing moldings, they were done, they chose shapes and chose things because they, they worked and did a job. Um, a supporting molding, like the ones in the top left, are, are lift up, okay? So if I get up underneath something and I'm, and I'm pushing up, right, that little, uh, I get a little thing, this little motion there coming up is a supporting molding, right? The other moldings on the right are terminating moldings. Ta-da, right? Finishing at the top. That's why crown moldings oftentimes at the top have this kind of shape and bed moldings have this kind of shape, right? And that's what you see in this, in, tab in this cornice here. We have a terminating molding at the top, but we have supporting moldings here because they're carrying weight, right? So, get it too crazy on it, but, it, but it is, there is purpose to these moldings. There is the way things are put together. The other thing that people don't understand is that the classical traditions of architecture, everybody, have you guys studied the five orders of architecture? Anybody? Bueller? Okay, so there's, there's basically five orders in the Renaissance, Tuscan, Doric, Ionic, Corinthian, and Composite orders, okay? Um, those orders, as they are put together, have traditions in wood, okay? So the original Greek temples were made in, out of wood, and they were later turned into stone, okay? At least that's the working theory. And so this example of the Doric order here shows that this uh, system is put together. You know, there's your column, there's your, tr your triglyph, right? The gute, the nails that are supporting the, the mutual up here. All of those things are based on wood construction. Uh, Marin Casado in her book, Get Your House Right, which is must reading, okay, shows how this original order and the terms that even come from this. And so that, that first beam that, supported, that supports the column is called an architrave, okay? Uh, that architrave means king beam, right? It's the main supporting beam that's supported by these columns. 
and then you, the triglyphs is just the end of the beam that's coming through that's supported by the architrave, right? So all of these moldings that show up here in this order, right, in this ionic order, have purpose and have traditions that go back to that original uh, wood construction. So sometimes we look at these details and we go, they're, they're kind of weird. They're kind of, where do they come from? They actually come from this wood tradition. The other thing about the orders is that there's a human scale to them, okay? And what that means is, is that th there's a reason why we go into old buildings and, and, and look at them and go, I don't know why I like it in here, but I like it. It's because they've been designed around a human scale. So the way it works is in this, uh, you know, let's this, this, this Tuscan Doric order here, there's a proportion, okay, of the width to the height, okay? It's in, in the, this, this lower orders here, it's a one to seven, okay? And the Ionic order, which is thought to be based on the female body, is one to eight. Now, I've measured my foot and it's uh, 11 inches long, okay? I'm 76 inches tall, right? One more inch, I'd be one to seven, right? That one to seven proportion. One inch from being perfect. <laughs> Kidding. The female is based on this, this, this ideal female body of one to eight. And if you measure, it, it's not everybody's body is going to conform to this thing, but the ideal proportion as the Greeks were putting together their buildings were based on this, this masculine and feminine orders. So Vitruvius, who is the early author who is writing about Roman and uh, Greek buildings, the only author from that period that we still have today, talked about the gender of these orders. And so that proportion, okay, they based everything off the human body. And so the temples and everything else, the, the human body was the uh, inspiration. And so, so just like my hands and my ears, my eyes, my face, size of my head, is all proportionate to my body, they wanted their temples to be proportionate as well. <clears throat> what that means is, is that all the parts and pieces work together, okay? And that's when they put together the orders, okay, they were doing it so that it was all proportionate, okay? Um, and, and essentially the orders are or, uh, proportioning systems. How to put together, you're like you're designing a building, you're like, I want it to all make sense. I want it to be cohesive. Oh, the orders, that's, the, that's how they did that. These orders then inform all the moldings that go into our houses. And so there's the pedestal, there's the column, okay? There's your entablature at the top, all terms that you guys need to know. Um, the height of the pedestal establishes the height of the chair rail in the room. The base is based off this, this order and this proportion. The architrave, the, the door and window casings are based upon this proportion. And depending on the size of your room, nine foot room versus 12 foot room, that order is gonna, the moldings are gonna grow and shrink based on the size of that room. Just like a very short person, a small person, small hands, very big person has big hands, those things change. The other thing it does is it helps establish hierarchy. Here are three rooms, okay? All the exact same rooms, okay? Here, the orders are, are totally shown in here, and this would be the entry hall of a very formal house, right? You'd have a chair rail, you'd have a pedestal, you'd have this, these carved moldings at the top, you might even have pilasters there. You step down into you know, uh, a study uh, you know, off the main hall, and it starts to be simplified. The columns are no longer there, they're implied. Uh, but those proportions are still there. And then up in the bedroom, you have the same proportions in place, but the, there's no pedestal, there's no chair rail or wainscot, the moldings are applied, there's not the full entablature, there's only a cornice, right? Exact same rooms through this hierarchy, through this system, we are able to communicate. So you walk into a house and you go, I know where I'm supposed to go because that looks like a closet, but that looks like actually the, the main area. Look how it's ornamented. Look how big it is. I'm supposed to go through there. So this system is a system that communicates. The reason most moldings are terrible today is because they don't follow this, these original patterns, okay? And so if you look at this order here, okay, what you're seeing on the, on the side, I don't know if you can see this, but this says one half D. Do you see that? Okay. So what's happened is, is in, in this system, it's all based on 
a proportion, D, because the diameter of the column at the base, right? Remember my 11 inches, okay? So all of those pieces are then sized based on D. That's why it says 1 8 D there, it says 1 16 D, it says 1 half D, right? So very simply, if you had a 12 inch column and you, know, you would have 1 half D would be a six inch base. So that, there's your base in the room, okay? There's, your, there's where to start as far as sizing moldings. There's math, there's, there's systems that have been put together to help you guys figure out how this is put together. Help you understand proper proportions, proper scale. I show this slide because this is a 1926 carpenter's manual, okay? This is, this is the design that carpenters, everybody used to understand, okay? That they had the Roman and the Greek orders. You see these numbers there? You see the 8D, 9D, 10D, 7D, right? That was, there were your proportioning system. There was your orders. There was how to put rooms, how to put houses together based on a system that everybody understood. There's another history class we could go through why this changed, but um, anyway, it, that that's there's a lot there. Okay, I just I just did an overview of you know classical moldings and classical systems that hopefully you know made your mind blow up a little bit, realizing how much you don't know. Okay, and how much information is there for us to gain, for us to build more beautifully. So. As we look at moldings 1740 to 1950, we're going to see a lot of change, okay? Really, the biggest change happens because of an era when we were hand-making everything to the era when we're machine-making everything. And if you realize that the Georgian Federal and Greek Revival eras, going up into probably the 1850s, 1860s, is a handmade era, okay? And that determines the way moldings look, the way moldings, why moldings are painted, why they're not stain grade in the Georgian period, because you couldn't hand plane oak very well, right? But you could hand plane white pine. Um, and in the machine made era, why Victorian houses have so much wood and so much things going on, because they had power mills that helped them, you know, do bird's eye maple, do, you know, mahogany, do oak, right? They were finally able to do this. So um, in the handmade era, hand planes were used to shape every molding, right? Um, that means that the craftsman who was making it was also the designer, okay? That there wasn't, they, they looked at design books to get inspiration, but they were, they were making decisions actually at the level of the individual craftsman making things. It was all craftsman dr driven. That's why things were paint grade. Machine era, okay, moldings become a commodity. Moldings become you know, available by the foot off the shelves of lumber yards, and it changes, this is a whole nother talk, but it changes why design changes so much um, and why things are more beautiful in a handmade era where they're based on a human scale versus a machine era where things just can get big because, they're, because they could do bigger, fatter moldings. Um, and it changes the way we design. And so that handmade era versus the machine made really changes design and really is the first step towards this kind of getting away from how things are beautiful. Um, how were moldings designed historically? Uh, there was pattern books, okay? Palladio was, was a pattern book, okay? His four books of architecture, highly influential. Y'all know who Andre Palladio is? Wow. Is that a yes, or am I putting you to sleep? Hello? Yes. Hello, everybody out there? Palladio. Andrea Palladio? No one? Wow. Okay. Um, Palladio was a, uh, um Italian craftsman. He was a stonemason, okay? He, uh, in the 1500s, he wrote a book in the 1570s called The Four Books of Architecture. The reason he called it the Four Books of Architecture because Vitruvius had written a book called the Ten Books of Architecture. They were all influenced by Vitruvius and everything else. He studied the past. He went to Rome and actually measured the buildings. And this is during a period where the Roman ruins were, were laying everywhere. They were in a cow field, okay? The Campo Vieno, or whatever it's called. It was a cow field because basically Rome was this great city, right? Time passes, it goes away. Paul gets crucified outside of Rome, right? And the Vatican City gets built up on Paul's tomb, right? That's why it's called St. Paul's, right? So 
Rome grows outside of the city. So the forum where all the major stuff that the, in the Roman period was there, it kind of falls into disrepair. And they're actually taking the marble off those great buildings and burning it for lime, okay? So he goes there and he's actually studying these historic buildings and he's actually measuring and figured out a way, these columns are way up in the air and he's trying to figure out how, what the proportions are. And he's studying these Roman buildings because he's like, who built this? Like, this is the most incredible, you know, place we could ever go and ever see. And I don't know how they got here, but everything's so beautiful. And I want to measure it. I want to draw it. I want to figure it out. And so he basically invents a style of building. All the English country houses are all Palladian, okay? He was super influential in England and therefore influential in America. Um, the White House is a Palladian building, okay? So just put it in perspective. Monticello, Palladio was his Bible. He wrote it all the time. He had four copies of Palladio's book because Thomas Jefferson loved, loved Andre Palladio. And his, you know, his, uh, his building is based on a Palladian styling, okay? So incredibly influential. Little backstory. <laughs> um, and so he would, he would actually measure those historic moldings, put them in his book, and that was one way guys looked at moldings and said, oh, the moldings should look like this because this is the way they were in Rome. There was books like James Gibbs' book on the left, uh, Mount Airy in Virginia was built based on, based on that book. So there was these influential pattern books by English authors mostly, Palladio as well, that helped determine the, and helped design things. This is a one of my favorite mantles at Winter Tour. This is uh, uh, the Hampton Room. It's based on this from Beatty Langley, who is a pattern book author. Notice that it isn't an exact copy. It's an inspiration, right? It, they're looking at that and going, oh, I could do this and I like this piece of it, but I'm going to change this. This is how design happens. So today you look at Pinterest or whatever you look at, house or, you know, the magazines you're inspired by. Unfortunately, our built environment isn't very inspirational, at least it's not to me, okay? So trying to find inspiration, trying to find beautiful things, I'm always having to look through the past to try to find those things. This is an Andre Palladio plate on the right, okay? This is that cornice at this, at this house, this cornice right up there, it's called a cornice, that entablature is based on that plate right there. Now, he is, doesn't have the carving that Palladio is showing there, but, but they basically looked at the past like this and came up with those moldings and those shapes. Now, <laughs> I don't know how much to say to you guys. Like, like I don't know, but I'm going to just keep talking, and it's going to be drinking from a fire hose, but you're going to love it, okay? Um, basically, these systems, okay, if you had a room that you had to design, okay, you can take the Doric order or the Ionic order, the Tuscan order, and use that to design the room, okay? So in this case, I take the, there's five parts here. See this? See this on here? Five parts. One, two, three, four, five. You divide a room into five parts, a 10 foot room. Let's just get, stay with my example. It helps you determine what the size of all these different parts and pieces are. So my entablature is two foot tall. Okay, so in a 10 foot room, I've got a two foot tall entablature. Notice that uh, that entablature is divided into eight parts. Okay, so each part is three inches. Okay, and this ends up driving your moldings. Okay, so that's why it was a part is basically, think of it as part one of the moldings. And so if you take that entablature, you got three parts, architrave, frieze, and cornice. Your architrave is six inches, your frieze is nine, and your cornice is, uh, is nine, okay? Now, why is that important? Because your architrave is your door and window casing, okay? So architraves in historic catalogs were always called architraves, okay? They never called them door casings until about 1890, 1900. There was always architraves, and everybody knew a window and door casing was an architrave. Um, and so if you have a 10 foot room and you're gonna do the Doric order, which is a very masculine order, your door casing is six inches tall. Now, or six inches wide. How many door casings six inches wide are there available in the market today? It's huge. There aren't many. There aren't any. Okay, you almost have to custom make a door casing that wide. Now, 
The reason I'm telling you that is because it's not two inches, okay? And, you know, the door casing around these things is maybe an inch and three quarter. That's too small, okay? And so the moldings that you're going to find at Home Depot are three inches, maybe four inches, right? And so realize that to properly define and lay out a room, you need to have bigger moldings. And part of understanding the past is understanding where these proportions come from. The Tuscan order, you break it into 19 parts, okay? You break your room into 19 parts. And I'm not really interested in you guys understanding the math. I'm really more interested in you helping you understand that a, uh, a two inch door casing is ridiculous, okay? And uh, the size of your base and everything else should be probably bigger than, than, than what you're using. Um, 10 foot tall, uh, 19 parts, your entablature is one foot seven. That means each of those parts is two and three quarters. It means your, your, your case, your crown at the very top is about two and three quarters. How many people think you can find a two and three quarter inch uh, crown for a room? Okay, there's very few of those because everybody likes to use big five inch crowns and six inch crowns and 10 inch crowns. Don't do it, okay? If there's anything you can learn from this talk, don't use a five inch crown, ever. OK, unless you're designing the outside of a house and it's a two story house, that's about when you can get into the proportion of a five inch crown. But five inches crown and people want to show off showing off all the crowns that they're able to put up there. We've kind of gotten crown crazy. OK, and people will have this simple room and then they'll throw up four parts in a crown. And it's just silly um, the way they're doing that. Anyway, I don't want to lose you guys. I feel like I already lost you. <laughs> What's the purpose of moldings? Anybody know that? Like, why do we use moldings? Okay. To visually reinforce structural elements, right? Right? And then introduce the scale and proportion. Okay, moldings are wonderful. There's, there's no better tool to use into a room that to introduce scale and proportion than moldings. So you need to be able to understand and use them properly so, so it makes sense, right? You should be communicating in the room uh, where the important pieces are, where you, uh, how to punctuate an opening. I talked about punctuation before. There's all these ratios, okay, about punctuating an opening. And if you look at the historic pattern books, they talk about that a door casing should be one to six to, or one to eight, the opening. So if you have three, six, 36 inch opening, your door casing and a one to six proportion should be six inches, right? That's a big door casing. One to eight maybe goes down to four and a half, okay? So, but anything smaller than that, you can't punctuate the opening. So you can't, how do you elevate a door opening? How do you treat it properly? Like this is a really important space, we wanna do it. You need big moldings, right? You need something that's gonna punctuate that opening and it's based on a proportion over the oversize, uh, overall size of the opening. Lancaster room, 1810. Okay, this is a federal style room, but look what's happening, okay? There's, look at that, see that? That's a pedestal. There's a column. There's your entablature, okay? Everybody see that? So there's your pedestal, there's your column, there's your entablature. All the moldings that we've been talking about are right there in the wall right? They are defining and determining the proportion and scale inside this room, right? And the organization of how this arch goes up and it just touches the bottom of that architrave, right? Means that this, this room starting to be unified. It's starting to bring the parts and pieces together so that these things make sense. This is not a random height of that arch there, right? It's laid out perfectly so that this proportion of this opening has this size uh, pilaster right there, but it just touches that uh, architrave when it runs around the room. There's a lot of thought that goes into that that you may not realize until you sit there and go, wow, they really organized this space wonderfully. Look how it's all put together. In this room, okay, this is a simpler room. This is called a frock tour room, 1780s in Pennsylvania. But look what's happening, okay, there's my pedestal, the, that height of that wainscot. My column is implied, okay? There's no column on the wall like that other one. It's implied in that space, and there's my cornice at the top. Now look what's happening with the, with the chair rail cap, 
Oh, it's unifying this corner cabinet and it ties across the height of those window sills. And so all of a sudden you go into that room and there's this wonderful little wainscot that goes around the room that is the window sill, that is the bottom of that, of that uh, built-in cabinet. And all of a sudden you go, oh, okay, th this is it's unified, it's brought together. I kind of like this. I kind of like how it's organized. This is a Chesterton room, same thing. Look, look what they did here. They've got the pedestal, right? The, right there and they painted it black, which is a wonderful little, pretty little detail that runs around this room. And then it ties right into this little bracket that is supporting this mantel shelf right there, right? And so then you see the little pedestal here and then your implied column, which is a panel in this case. So there's, there's a panel that's implied that applies in the column, then your cornice at the top. So <coughs> all the things I've been talking about have been used and are used in the past to help make something beautiful. And you walk into a space and you go, I don't know why I like this room, but I really like it. Why is it? Because even the size of the panels, right? Even this thing isn't too big and fat and wide. It's actually tall and thin. It lifts your eye, right? It's really wonderful and beautiful how it works. Going into a federal period, which is a little bit later, 1820, 1810, right? There's a lot less moldings in this place, but the proportions are still there. Right? I still have a pedestal and a wainscot cap, okay? All I have is a chair rail, right? Um, but that pedestal height is, is established. There's my implied column, and there's a very simple cornice at the top, right? The other thing that's happened in this federal period is they, uh, the entablature and the fireplace and over the door thing is exaggerated, and they put this decoration into the frieze subtle things that happen through different periods that allow you to, to look at them and, and date them and everything else. So this is a Georgian room. It's the Cecil bedroom and window tour. Notice there's no mantel shelf, but these moldings, okay, because it's 1760, what was happening is in the Georgian period, they were looking at books like Palladio, who had studied Roman ruins, okay, the exterior of those Roman buildings, and they and looked at it, and so the moldings were huge because they had used the moldings that were used on the outside of the building, and they kind of looked at it and they go, wow, these moldings are really big and thick. So Georgian moldings are fat, they're really bold, okay, because they were taken off the outside of the buildings. Okay, during the neoclassical era, Robert Adam, guy you need to know, uh, English author, Scottish author, uh, architect, he goes to Pompeii. Everybody know Pompeii? Okay. Pompeii, the, the, the volcano goes, covers the town in ash. Thousand years later, they uh, start opening it up, start realizing there's a town underneath here. They start realizing that the Roman interiors were nothing like they'd been drawing. They saw these Roman interiors and they were colorful and they were dainty and there, was, there, there weren't big moldings. And so neoclassical era, okay, new classicism starts and moldings change, okay? So in the Georgian period, like the, the room like this, the moldings are big and thick. Look at the panel, or the raised panel here that's happening over top of that. It is big and thick and sitting off the wall. Uh, the Hampton bedroom, also big, thick molding, 1760. These would be Georgian. <clears throat> Told, showed you that frock tour room, also big, thick, bulbous moldings, moldings that kick out into the room. This begins to get into a little bit of a, a transitional room, okay? This is the Chesterton room I was showing you. The moldings aren't as kicked out. They're, the, the panels on the wall aren't raised panels, they're flat panels, and things begin to change. So like this, this uh, Sheraton room I was showing you, um, very simple moldings, okay? This decoration that's happening in the freeze, app happening up there, the urns and the swags and the different things that you see there are all part of that decoration that they saw on the walls of Pompeii and they said, oh, look, that's how they did it. And so you see these motifs that come from Pompeii that begin to influence this style. This is the uh, another uh, federal room. But look how ornate, okay, that's the keystone right here, okay, right over this arch. Look how ornate that is. Now, you don't see that ornamentation when you look at the room, but look how much detail is in there, okay? That is all detail that has been done because the federal period is a lighter, daintier, not as heavy, and there's a lot of decoration and detail in these moldings. 
more federal moldings, more federal detail, very light, dainty things. There's the uh, little swags you see up here uh, happening above that typical decoration. Okay, and look what the difference is between the Georgian and the federal. Okay, here I've got big, thick moldings that stick out, very thin moldings. Okay, look how big my corn, my broken pediment is. Look how simple these moldings are. Right, so you know there's a perfect example of a Georgian molding, big, fat, thick, sticking off the wall about three inches. Okay, these federal moldings maybe inch and a half. Georgian molding there, typical cross-headed corner. Uh, big thick moldings, very simple moldings in the federal period. This is the pattern book, William Payne. Look at his detailing that he's showing, 1786. Uh, there's his decoration. There's where it shows up in this federal period. So Georgian and federal oftentimes get confused when we build colonial revival houses. You can use both, but you need to realize the subtlety of where they come from. Look what's happening with this panel, federal panel flat panel, there's a smaller little applied molding. Look what's happened in the Georgian period, you get a raised panel moldings, big things that stick off the wall. These would be federal moldings because of all this light dainty decoration here. When you get into the Greek Revival period, right, <coughs> there's a new inspiration. And essentially the, the war of Greek independence happens about 1820. They break away from the Ottoman Turks. Americans and British are looking at the Greek culture, realizing that it influenced so much of the Roman culture, and they realize that the Greek culture was actually one of the first democracies. And so they are looking at the Greek buildings and the Greek temples and going, that's what we want our buildings to look like. And so Greek revival architecture becomes very uh, popular in America. But you'll see this decoration and, these, and the moldings and everything in this period become very stone-like, okay? They become, uh, the decoration's kind of thick and like it, like it had been made with stone. Some Menard Lefevre book, the two-panel door is very popular. But this kind of decoration was the decoration that they, all, they saw on, the, uh, on the, uh, the Acropolis in Athens and the kind of decoration they were put around doors and they said, we want that kind of decoration in our houses. So you end up with these columns, right, that are either side of a door or a window, full entablature at the top, the big strong entablature, this kind of decoration, all part of that Greek Revival era. Um, this kind of rosette that's very popular in the Victorian era, becomes very popular in the Federal period, um, was popular in the Federal period, and as the Victorians are the ones that are actually copying that. Um, but look how big some of these moldings end up being in, the, in this Georgian period. This is a door casing in a house in South Carolina. That door casing is probably 10 inches wide, okay? It's huge. It's like this big, maybe a foot wide. Um, that kind of decoration at the top. Um, and this is kind of the largest period of moldings inside a house that you're going to see. These are very big moldings. When you get into the uh, post-industrial era, things begin to change so much because factories have a big influence on um, design and style. Uh, early, early pattern books, uh, 1873 steam planing mill uh, would show moldings like this. This is an 1880s catalog. These are huge, okay? So look what it says at the top. Designs for architraves, right? Remember I said that before? I wasn't lying, there it is. Designs for architraves and bases. So these are all base moldings in the house. These are door casings, okay? This door casing sits six inches by nine inches, okay? It's a monster, okay? Uh, kind of typical in that Victorian period. Uh, 1890s, there became a standard uh, molding catalog uh, that was put into, it became standardized in this industry, and molding catalogs became very popular. They would show inside these catalogs typical details of the way a room should look. So you see these Victorian rooms laid out with the header blocks and the rosettes and all the different moldings, uh, examples of how they think, mold, they think a room should look. Panel molds, all this kind of crazy decoration. The reason they're doing this decoration in the Victorian period is because they can. They finally have machines that can do the carving for them. They finally have machines that can make the, the hardwood moldings that they were never able to make before. And so there's an exuberance and excitement. And it's the reason why Victorian moldings look like this, right? That they, there's not a surface that they're not decorating, that they're not putting some decoration on. 
partly because they can, and machines have made it easier to do that. There's a rejection of that in the, Victor in the arts and crafts period, rejection of all that ornamentation. That's why that arts and crafts period is a simpler period. Um, you still see great design and dedication uh, uh, and moldings, but look how, look how almost a machine like that is and, and simple, almost no ornamented face. Uh, that would be a very good modern molding that would look very machine-like even today. They had catalogs, 1927, showing how molding should be put together into a room. And by 1936, okay, so the Great Depression is in 1929, going into the 30s, by 1936, look what happens to moldings, okay? Uh, there's, look, there's door casings um, right there. Okay, see that door casing? See what size that says? One and a half by two inches, okay? So starting in that, after the Great Depression, they're trying to economize moldings, and this is when moldings all fall apart. This is when, you know, the clamshell molding is the most modern, unadorned, non-classical molding that you can get, and it's the reason why it's so popular in those mid-century modern houses, because it is a modern molding. But the problem is it's cheap, and you see these, you know, the moldings that come out, this is a 1956 catalog with the three-step base and the three-step casing, a very, very popular moldings in the 40s and 50s um, is shown right there and how small these moldings are getting. So there's a very quick overview of moldings, 1740 to 1950. What should you do with all this information, this fire hose you've been drinking from, okay? So number one is... And if there's one thing I want you to learn from this is never put your chair rail at 36 inches. Write that down. I'm serious. Write that down. Never put your chair rail at 36 inches. OK, why? OK, because the the proportions that are laid out in that classical system. OK, have the pedestal down here. OK, uh, 28 to 32 inches is what your chair rail should be. You have to get to a room of 15 foot tall to have a chair rail that proportionally should be at 36 inches. So if you're doing large cathedrals and you have a 20 foot ceiling, you can put your chair rail higher. But for most houses, eight, nine, 10, 12 foot rooms, no chair rails over 32 inches. Windowsill heights should line up. Molding should unify rooms, should help pull things together. And so we looked at those rooms where it's tied into the corner piece, it tied into the windowsill. Moldings unify a space, visually unify it. So start finding ways to tie moldings together. Start, start finding ways to find the base and the casing and the crown all to make sense. I think the most important molding you can put in a room if the client has no money is a chair rail. I'd put a chair rail into a room long before I put a crown in the room because that chair rail and that height, like this is too, this, I know it's probably done for acoustics, but this is too high, right? This should be down farther and Establishing that height is going to bring more visual height to the room, okay? It's going to drop that down, and that panel or that, that implied column is going to lift your eye visually. I would not make any door casings or window casings less than four inches wide, okay? So do not go get two and a quarter inch casings, three inch casings. Everything should be at least four inches. And for base moldings, I know a lot of builders out there that will say, I want a 12 inch or 14 inch base. Don't do it, okay? One, proportionally, according to the classical system, there isn't a precedent for that. Two, go, it's much more important to create the strength in the base to make a thicker base than it is to make a taller base. And so, again, um, proportions really matter. Just some examples. I showed you, talked to you about that room. I'm almost done if I'm putting you to sleep. The, uh, uh, this is that room where it tied everything together. Look what's happened in this room, okay? They've done a very, they've done a stain grade, maybe even cherry uh, wainscot here. But look, it's at the height of the, the um, handle, so we know it's at 36 inches. I don't know if you can see it in there, but they've painted stripes on the walls there. Why do you think they painted thin stripes on the walls? They kind of wanted to lift the eye visually, right? They wanted to lift the eye. But the reason that it looks too clunky is because this is only an eight foot space and this takes up almost half the wall. So if they had dropped this down, right, come down in here, they wouldn't have needed paint stripes on the wall because it would have lifted your eye visually naturally. This is the kind of thing that you see builders do, right? 
where they, they want to throw a lot of moldings at the room. Okay, they want to make it look impressive. And I could take their molding budget, probably cut it in half and make that room look 10 times better because I understand the proper scale and proportion of moldings, which moldings go where, you know, how high this wainscot should be, why it shouldn't line up with this. Look at this wainscot, it's actually above the doorway, about 48 inches, right? The, the size of that column, all of those different things are wrong, okay? And they, you look at it and go, ooh, kind of busy, right? If you understand how to put the moldings together, you can make a space like that beautiful, all because you're just looking at the past, putting that together. Why is this door, door header not work, okay? Again, I could take a third of the budget on this one. I would lower the chair rail, right, that's already above the doorway. I would lower it down to about here, right? And then I, what is this, right? It's, it's casing, 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 right? There's no pause there, there's no, there's no stopping, right? It's just a loud group of moldings that you don't need a crown that big in, in a room that's only eight feet, maybe eight and a half feet tall. And so there's a uh, restraint that if you understand how these moldings get put together, you can help make your rooms more beautiful, help make these spaces more beautiful by not getting crazy. Then just, I talked to you, you kind of figured it out. I saw a few people when I got into the 1930s. But look at the door changes in door casing, right? Then that Georgian Federal era, you see that six inches, five inches. Victorians, sometimes they're in the six, seven, eight inches. Arts and crafts, you begin to see molding shrink a little bit. By that period revival era, four inches is about as big as you get. And then you get after that period and even up in the day and then they're very small. Um, and so th there is that punctuation I was talking about, that one to six, one to eight ratio. Um, means that if you wanted to find an opening, if you want to punctuate it properly, you do need bigger moldings to do that. Here is an example of a, a Georgian molding at Winter Tour. Um, three inches off the wall, six inches wide, right? Here's a federal molding. See, it's getting daintier. These little beads make it, uh, help it reflect light differently. And there's your 50s clamshell. That's how much things have changed. Um, okay, <laughs> what do you think? <laughs>